Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. So Steve, when did you first become interested in aviation? Um, I grew up in a farm um, in Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, a huge farm, 32,000 acre farm. And this was in the 50s. And um, at that stage, the British bombers and fighters used to come down to Rhodesia and they would just fly low level over the countryside. Nice. And seeing these aircraft, you know, it was, it, I think I was about five years old. And that obviously triggered something. And I really wanted my, also on the farm, the, the farm owner, my dad was a cattle manager, but the farm owner had a little half a tri pacer. And he sometimes just take my mum to town and I'd go along. Obviously, I was a little um, ankle biter at that stage. But I remember one of my first words apparently was upper, which was an aeroplane, or in Deggy, which was the African word for it. So that's when it started, mum. That's when it started. And nice. from then I went on to uh, school. Um, I got more and more interested in in flying, um, in aeroplanes, and any of the other Second World War aeroplanes. But I think I might have sent you a photograph of um, a, a J-29 Saab of, and, and, the, and the one breaking away. And that was a trigger for me. And I said, that's, I want to be that guy in, in the jet fighter. Away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was 15 when the hunters arrived. And of wow. course, that was, I, was, I, I want to fly one of those. Um, yeah. And that's at that stage, and we're sort of working towards that. Yes. So can you talk us through uh, when you joined the Rhodesian Air Force and what the process was like? Because uh, I've never talked to a, a, you know, a pilot from this country before. So what was the process like going through to be an officer or a pilot? Yes. Well, um, Mike, well, I actually started off as a, as a technician. I didn't have the qualifications. And it's not a uh, – I've heard a lot of your interviews with um, – um, you, people have to go through university and that type of stuff. With us, we just had to get a good O-level, um, mainly in English uh, and physics and maths. Um, I didn't actually qualify that to us. So I joined as a technician. I was still wanting to fly, and I was an instrument fitter. So for two years, I went through the training, and then two years, I was on the squadrons, and I only ever actually worked on the Hunter and also the Hunter Simulator. And while I was going through that process, I then applied. And it took me three goes um, before I was accepted, Wow. And um, but that's basically how we went. We went straight from school into a, a cadet program. They had a lot of people apply, and then the course went from there. And from then it was fairly standard, I think, with most courses. We did about six uh, six months, six weeks, basically, um, uh, sort of foot soldier and that type of thing. And then started our our, our, our uh, proper lectures, and then the training started. Flying started at that stage. Yeah, so can you talk us through some of the flying training and what aircraft did the Air Force have at the time to get you up to speed to go onto the front line? Well, we had the we started off with the Piston Provost. That was our training for six months. We did about 110 hours on that. And then we went on to the Vampire T-11. Nice. And that was another six months on that um, training. And then from there, we all went to OCU. Uh, some people called it OTC, but Operation Conversion Unit. And we did our bombing and, and gunnery and rockets on, on that. And from there, um, everyone then split up. Um, and that was at the end of our training base, the end of the OCU. Um, we, had, we were a small air force, and we tended to fly everything. And initially, um, I was, uh, most guys who were going to go to fight the stayed on the Vampire. And um, then um, the other chaps went to um, our sort of... Um, we had at that stage, we used a provost for um, forward airfield control and close support. And then sh uh, shortly after that, some guys would go to helicopters. They generally wanted a bit more experience. Out of the blue, a friend and I, we came top on our course uh, on the flying side. We went straight to Hunters. Nice. And that's another story in itself. 
Yeah, and we're going to get into the hunters in a bit. Yes. But um, did the Air Force, uh, w w was there the frontline aircraft uh, in the fighter world, the hunter at that time for you guys? It was in the Vampire. The Vampire was a more of a, um, uh, well, both of them ground attack primarily. Um, and uh, the Vampire T-11, we never, at that stage, we weren't using the single seater because it didn't have ejection seats. And yeah. before that, they, they, they'd used, they had a single seater FB-9 and later, uh, towards the end of the Bush War, they went back to single seaters with FB-5s, but also without an ejection seat. But, wow. but to answer your question, it was the T-11 and the, the, we had, at that stage, we, when, I was, when I went on to that, we had 11 hunters and vampires, probably about the same number. So yeah, t talk us through when you uh, went through your training and said you've been selected for hunters. That must have been an amazing moment for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big surprise, a huge surprise, Mike, because we didn't have a two-seater. And the way that the training, yeah, the way that the training went at that stage is the guys um, would go out into the squadrons, and because we flew everything, we had cameras as well for our bombing role, although they did put rockets under the nose for them as well. But we had, uh, yeah, we had <laughs> which caused a couple of problems with cracks later, but still. Um, the chaps tended to fly everything for, for until they got to sort of flight lieutenant stage, wow. uh, and perhaps late flying fly officer stage, or we, um, air lieutenants we call them. Then they would come back to the hunter with a lot of experience. And the way um, that my friend and I went on to the hunter, it was um, it was obviously very exciting because I was expecting that at the end of my career. That was my ambition, and here I was going straight. There was a there was a reason for it, which we'll come to. Um, but uh, we went straight to the hunter after you finished the OCU virtually, and the simulator was broken. So we couldn't fly for, we couldn't even fly for six weeks. Wow. And then it was straight from the vampire with its <laughs> meager acceleration, and then <laughs> onto the hunter. <laughs> One of the things I'd had, I was fortunate in that I'd worked on the hunter for a year as a, as a technician on the hunter simulator. And I'd actually learned to fly. It was a horrible thing to fly, it was very good for procedures. Um, but I had a fairly good knowledge of the workings of the hunter anyway. But still, we had to wait for the six weeks. And then we went on to um, did our simulator training. And then we went in, on to, the, the, to fly it. And that was interesting because I've noticed that some of the chaps talking on your interviews, um, they didn't have a two-seater. They would go up with a buddy um, who would fly with them and then talk them through it. Mm -hmm. Well, based on our experience with, with Rhodesia, the chaps had come straight onto the hunter and they sort of tapped you on the head and said, away you go. <laughs> they didn't have a chap in the tower. The, 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 the uh, instructor was in the tower. But um, yeah, going out, it was just an unreal feeling to be sick. Because the, the vampire, was, you were quite entombed in the T-11. You know, there was the first ejection seat you sat forward. You had the canopy down here and being a tall fellow as well. Everything was really rather cramped, but then to sit in this canopy back, taxiing out on the taxiway, it was exhilarating, you know. Mm -hmm. And then with the power going up, and then this boot that you got for the hunter, yeah, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. The, one of the guys mentioned on takeoff in the hunter, this waggling of the wings, because the hunter was very light on the controls. And, and everyone, everyone except the helicopter pilots of the Alouette, all waggle the wings. Well, I think I waggle mine a lot more than, than the rest. <laughs> but it was very light on the controls. Yeah, yeah, but it was amazing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, what marks of the Hunter did uh, the Rhodesians have at the time? We had the FGA nine. They were, um, yeah, they were upgraded F sixes um, to FGA nine. Stayed with the strength and under uh, for, for ground attack and all that uh, and. Um, well, yeah, basically, it was an F-6 with uh, with extra ground attack capability, which if you want to call it that. Yeah, so it was, um, and they were all, I think, I don't think we actually got a new one. They were all reconditioned from the Royal, Royal Air Force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was in 63 we got them. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about some of your gra uh, flying training, sorry. And yeah, what kind of things did uh, your Air Force want from the Hunter? Was it air to ground, air to air, like, or was it a mixture of both? It was primarily at the ground. We, we um, from a training point of view, and once again without the two seater, we tended to get. Uh, we had uh, only six of us on the squadron at the time, and we had um, they were all flight attendants, and then my friend and I who were we called air sub attendants. They were basically pilot officers, and um, they would we would start once we done our solos and that type of stuff. We then flew with one of these guys to uh, um, we, we weapons training and that, 
And if we, and when I was on the squadron, we just had the gun, the front gun, mm-hmm. and the um, rockets, the, the 68 millimeter um, SNEB rockets. And that's all we were training on that stage. We obviously did um, um, camera attacks and that quarter attacks and that type of thing. And we played a bit with, uh, we called it rats and terriers, a bit of dog fighting, but it was nothing really serious. Mm-hmm. I only started that when I got to the Mirage. Primarily, um, was, it was air to ground, uh, but we were given a lot of freedom. And uh, we could probably talk about this. Once, virtually, I, I don't mean solo much before, within about a month or so, we were off international. <laughs> Wow. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about this now. It's a sort of a story. I'm yeah, go for it. Yeah. Well, on the outboard, the Hunter had, we could put, we generally flew with 230 drop tanks um, inboards. That gave us a, a decent amount of, of mm-hmm. time in the air. And on the outboards, if we were going in sort of distance, we put 100 gallon drop tanks on. And what the technicians have done is they've taken the front and the back of the drop tanks and uh, cleaned up the inside and put in wing nuts. And what oh, we no. would do. <laughs> It was cool strategic navigation. We would take off and fly down to the coast, either to Mozambique or to South Africa, and fly along the beach for a long way, land somewhere, um, have a nice lunch in our flying kits, um, and then fill up with prawns and wine and fly home again. It was very gentle <laughs> land to home. And that was, honestly, that was the sort of freedom we were, we were given. And wow. by that stage, yeah, I, my, my, my um, final cross country was to Cape Town. I've never been there. And that was an amazing experience. And also the longest flight I've ever done on a fighter. We did three and a half hours. Uh, but when we got there, the winds had begun and we were able to fly right around the peninsula before we landed. Yeah, we, we, it was a, a really an interesting time. It really was. Yeah, and you've got the backdrop of, you know, <laughs> all that in, the, in a hunter. You couldn't ask for more, could you? Absolutely amazing. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> amazing. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I know a good bunch of guys as well. Absolutely. So let's go into a bit of uh, the nitty gritty of the hunter. What were its strengths and weaknesses? Certainly, the strength anyone can uh, can agree with me is that looks. It's obviously a beautiful looking aeroplane. Um, it's um, I've, it's the visibility was good, not as good as we would as a, when we got to F 16s and that type of thing. Yes. But um, it was very really good for when it came to when I came back to the hunter. We did quite a bit of dog fighting, ACM. And it was good for that. Um, handling, absolutely amazing handling. You know, it was uh, light on the controls and um, very easy. It was a delight to fly. After my first solo, the first solo was quite it was quite exciting because there was a lot going on, and I was sitting on the tail somewhere, and but I eventually managed to get it down. But after it, after it was very very good to fly, um, very easy to fly. Um, incredible acceleration and. When I got to the Mirage, in my first, you know, when you, you go to full power and release brakes, you expect this thump. But actually, the Hunter was a bigger acceleration than it was at Military Thrust. Uh, wow. after. Yeah, it, it, but only when you got an after when it was different. Very comfortable low level flying, which was very important for us. Um, we did a lot of low, low, low level flying, photo recce as well, because we needed that as uh, with the sort of flying we we're doing. And you could happily fly along with 500 knots comfortably, without, and especially in Africa with all the heat and everything. Very, very comfortable to fly. And um, yeah, it, it, then a bit of the, from the, well, I should, I should say one more thing about it, which you'll probably come on to at some stage. The, I've heard you talk about the, the A-10 Warthog pilots. Mm. The Hunter's front gun, 30 millimeter, four of them firing together, is second only to the Warthog in firepower, I believe. Wow. And yeah, I experienced that in, in, in dramatically, um, or dramatically, I should say. Um, um, when we, we did a strike once, in, in our first big strike in, in, in the war, and we were taking a, a, a bend in the river, and there were five of us, and we went in, and we fired our rockets first, the, all, um, the, the, the both pods from each of us, one strike, we came around, and, and there was fairly bit of dust around. After the five of us had gone through the full front gun, that was it. We fired nine seconds each. There was 540 rounds each, and there was nothing on the ground. It was wow. just demolished. It felt like riding my horse when I was doing it, but it was amazing firepower. So that was a, a really a, a, an enormous strength in the aircraft, which I believe was designed to be able to climb out, take out a bomber, um, a bear bomber. And I was confirmed that by the RAF guys. That's what its original role was. But it did a wonderful job for us. That's but the weaknesses, for me. Yeah, <laughs> the weaknesses, <laughs> if anything, these are sort of personal. Um, 
it had the stick was really high, and for and that was to me it was a it was a big thing um, because it, it it even covered the, the your your compass, and I only assumed because the aircraft had manual reversion, um, if you lost your hydraulics, you could then fly it. But obviously it was heavy at that stage, and I could only assume that it was the leverage that you required. And it became very apparent to me once, and I lost the booster pump on um, one side, and I, all the fuel hung up in my drop tank. Oh. So I came home flying like this, and I could actually see my compass for the first time. <laughs> 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 when, I, when I bought my Hunter, and I was hoping to get it flying, I, we can talk about that a bit later. A friend of mine yeah. bought a two seat in Australia, and I flew that for him. But I decided if I ever got my plan, I was going to get permission from the from. CASA, or just the local authority, was to actually be able to split the control column and drop it, you know, and put a split pin in. Mm. And so I could fly down here as opposed to having it was the way it was. And, the, and as I talk, we'll talk about the Mirage. That's how it was. And then if, say, if I lost my control, my, my power controls, I could take it up and put the pin on the top. Anyway, that was, to me, was, it was a weakness. The second week was, just, was a lot more dramatic. Uh, we lost one hunter when I was a technician. Um, the guy was was just flying past the city, and he lost all his fuel. Basically, just the fuel, the gauges went down, wow. and it worked out. It was a, a metal pipe that went from the booster pumps to the engine, and that had burst. It happened a second time to one of our guys. He managed to dead stick it into to land much later. But I mentioned that again because when I came to fly the Hunter here, the two seater, it took seven years to restore it. And just before we flew it, I went to the engineer. We had one guy basically was restored this thing. I said to him. That pipe that goes from the booster pump to the engine, that I'm feeling is a weakness. He said, come with me. He showed me the old one. He put a new one in. So they obviously oh. realized. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a weakness. But other than that, um, the cockpit layout, um, uh, people have spoken, perhaps spoken about that. It, ergonomically, it was a nightmare. We bought yeah. some from Kenya later. And uh, uh, the chap who came, one of the, the majors in the Kenyan Air Force came, came up to me and said, do you fly? Are you coming to get that? I said, yes. He said, I love flying the Hunter. He said, but what are they doing? You've heard the story before. They got all the instruments and threw it over the shoulder. Yeah, yeah. They landed. That's because <laughs> yeah. he was flying the he was flying the F five Tiger. And that's oh, just an yeah. example. Of that. yeah. We only had an ADF. Only navigation equipment we had on the our Hunters was an ADF, and it was one of those coffee grinder ones. Mm -hmm. And it was way down the back here on the right. So now you're in bad weather. You've got to take your hand off the throttle. Off the control gun, put your hand off the throttle, and then wind this thing up to get the knee, you know. So that was anyway. That was that's by the by. But the the, the strength far outweighed the weaknesses, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I've it heard is. that many times. But uh, you kind of mentioned uh, DACT BFM there. How did the hunter fare in that kind of environment? We the only time we really got to do that, we we didn't have much dissimilar. Uh, only, I never experienced it with, uh, with the Mirage. When we used to fly down once again on one of our jollies down to South Africa. We were sometimes attacked. Well, I was never in that situation by the Mirage. But they'd never get in with the Mirage because they tried to come down to the hunter speed. The hunter could turn beautifully. Mm. And only later when we did a lot more, having come back from the Mirages, we learned how to fly, uh, to fly the hunter to its best capabilities, which Jenny was just into the buffet. And she did very well. We had a, we had a chap join us from the Singapore Air Force. And um, yeah, they'd also done very well with the hunter flying. As long as you, if you were in something like a mirage, you, would want to, you wouldn't want to get anyone near one because he would turn out, turn you for sure. Mm -hmm. And eventually the guys had, had, had missiles on them as well. Yeah. So they did and pretty was, well. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, let's talk about your first squadron. Uh, what was the, where were you based? And uh, yeah, what squadron were you with? <clears throat> Yeah, the, 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 we only had two bases. The one was in um, in now Harare, and there was new serum. I assume there's an old serum in England somewhere, mm -hmm. or a serum. And we had Thornhill, which was in the middle of the country, and that was our fighter base basically. We did the training there, and with the, we were and the hunters and the vampires were both based on in in Thornhill. And from Thornhill, we could go anywhere in the country with fuel, and also um, we had bingo lights at 650 pounds a side. And if those went off while we were low over anywhere in Rhodesia or Zimbabwe, we could climb out and get back to base. And that was a really good thing. And we, by that stage, it was becoming, uh, towards the end, my end of the time in Hunts, we were doing a lot of border patrols and that type of thing. And it was just lovely, low level flying, but you always knew. Very strategic for us operating from Thornhill. 
Mm-hmm. And that's where I spent most of my time as a technician, obviously, and as a pilot yeah, in the Air Force. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And was it like a, a QRA? Like, was it 20, uh, 24-7 kind of thing, like, um, you know, to defend the country? Yeah, it was. It, we, we, it was. We weren't on in the cockpit very often. Well, not in the cockpit at all, but not even in this crew. We had a two-hour to get airborne. Um, and um, the... The, towards when I was on the squad and before I went to Muras, we did a, we did a couple of strikes. It got a lot hotter towards the end, but we generally had two guys um, ready to go at any stage. Uh, I'm called call out, mm-hmm. um, and I, I should mention at this stage, uh, possibly, um, that in our air force, by the time I got back to instruct um, after having been on the Mirages and flying helicopters, we were finding that the guys didn't want to to be on jets anymore. When they were coming out of training, wow. they wanted to go to the helicopter. Hmm. Yeah, because we had a very, uh, I don't think, we, can I talk about that now? It, it'll go on for a little while. But yeah, it, it might, yeah. No, yeah. absolutely, go for it. Yeah, what was happening, we had a really, um, a very good way of dealing with uh, anti-terrorist type of stuff. We had a thing called a fire force, and it, it, it operated around a, heli- a single gunship helicopter, which is the Alouettes, mm-hmm. with a 28 mil cannon sticking out of the side, uh, and generally three troopers. So the gunship was the leader, and he had the three troopers behind with four troops on board. Now, the fire force also consisted, with, with, besides the gunship, it had a DC-3 Dakota, which 26 troops on board, which you could drop, parachute drop, and also a 336 uh, Lynx uh, push-pull uh, Cessna type thing. It was actually the, the French one, the Reims. And he fly, flew above um, for close support and radio and that type of thing. And um, if the, 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 the action got too hot, we had jets to be to call in. And that's where the, the, the call came from. Right. So now the, the chap running this whole show was basically the gunship pilot. He had an army guy sitting next to him. Who would Once he would, once they got airborne and found out where the, the enemy were, he would then... I advised the pilot where he'd like to put his troops down. Um, and, and so that was his task. But quite often, they were sitting going backwards. They were quite quite a lot of inexperience. And Jenny was the gunship pilot who pitched up into, into action, sorted these guys out with the, with the 20 moles, and then said to the Army command, where Army command, where do you want your guys? And he, he might be being sick or he wasn't quite sure or disoriented. And the, the Air Force gunship pilot was with experience. We always had experience. I would like... I suggest one there, one there, one there. So he would put them down, talk to talk the pilot, the, the troopers in, the troops, and then if there were, the action was was more than we anticipated, he would then call the DC three and drop troops at five hundred feet. Now, if it continued, and they were still firing, he would call up the jets, and the jets would was, would take off. They'd be there within an hour, and when they arrived, the the, the links or the what do you call them? The links was a three three six. Would put under under direction of the gunship pilot, put in napalm or something like that to 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 uh, in, in, uh, sort of uh, show the target, and the hunters or the cameras would come and boom and go home. Mm. So the task of the that the task as far as the students were concerned was with the gunship pilot. That's what they wanted to do. The hunter pilots would just get airborne and, and and just blasting holes on the ground. We didn't know what they were looking at. That. So that was it was interesting. And when we got there back there from instruction, from flying the Mirage and doing ACM and this type of thing, we used to do quite a bit of it in training. <laughs> you sort of but but be carefully, we did the rules of combat and that type of thing. But we tried to get these guys interested back into wanting to go to hunters as opposed to go to the helicopter. As I've heard some of you guys talk about when when, when people graduate from 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 the flying from flying, it's generally fighters, bombers, transport, helicopters. Yeah. And here we are, the guys wanting to go to helicopters. It was a, <laughs> it was, I did that for a couple of years, but it was a very interesting task. But anyway, just there was side aside. I can see that's where the, the that's where the call out was. They would be called out from the, from that position. It got a lot more. Um, they got a lot more involved later in the war. Um, where they were doing not so much those sort of strikes for hunters. So, Steve, I also heard that the hunter cockpit has a unique smell. Apparently, that's leather, old oil smell. Is that true? Absolutely. I think I sent you something about all the hunters I've been involved with around the world. And even the one, and they all smell the same. And even the one in uh, Queensland, it would have been sitting in a schoolyard in Singapore for years, an ex RAF 4. And um, they brought it out to Queensland. They somehow acquired it, 
and it was sitting under a cover. It was just a, like a carport. Uh, and I put my nose in, and sure enough, there was the smell again. <laughs> and apparently it's a bostick. I don't know. Someone, eventually someone told me, because it's always the same. And someone mentioned the glue they used at the time. I don't know if that's true, but it, but you're quite right. It was the same smell, which is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I do remember, yeah. like, I went to a museum once, and the hunter almost has, like, a unique smell. You can come in, it smells almost like the past, almost, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It was very familiar. <laughs> anyway, <it> was really... <laughs> Absolutely. So, on your squadron, how many jets were available to uh, for you guys to fly, and how many pilots were there? We only had the six when I was there initially, and that was before the things got a bit hot as well. But um, and you won't believe it, we had about twenty four technicians total. We had eleven jets. And um, we'd always have one in, in major servicing. There might be one in primary service style or something like that. But there were always six on the line every time. And there would be another couple ready for us. So we'd probably have about eight serviceable the whole time. It was amazing because um, I haven't been there myself as a technician. Um, it, we, we tended to help each other. I spent a lot of time on the engines because the, the engine was a difficult thing to work on. You had to make special spanners and everything to be able to get in different places. And the, being an instrument, but there wasn't a lot going on in the, in the cockpit, you know. Once that, you know, it just matter of taking that something out and replacing it. But um, on the engines, it was hard work. But I mean, with 24 technicians, and we virtually had 80% serviceability all the time. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. And with the six pilots, you know, and we were doing air shows. And I mean, even with, I think it was after two or three months, two or three months, we did a six ship air show um, in this, oh, this, yeah. our city. Yeah. <laughs> it was full on. It was fantastic. Amazing. It was amazing. But I'll tell you about my experience of being a technician and um, and then going on to flying, because it was only it was only 22 months from the time I left as a technician back as a pilot. But one of the problems we had with the gun site, you had this radar, this um, two script ranging. We didn't use the radar. They had a, a radar ranging, but we never used it. So you had to sort of lie, get the wingspan of the aircraft, and then you twisted this twist grip here to make it work. Well, there was a relay box down the back here, and it, when it, if it didn't work, that box was the problem. It was a relay box, you know, the old relays. So I've still got this, this screwdriver. I used to take a screwdriver with me, and I would lean back because I knew what fixed it. And I'd beat <laughs> <laughs> the, also, on our these these cross countries, we these the strategic cross countries we went on down to Mozambique and South Africa, and some guys went to Angola. They always liked to have me along because we only had single seaters, and the engine starter sometimes gave a problem. The engine starter, which they had the same on the Lightning, I think, and, mm-hmm. and I knew you had to fix that. So I would be very popular. Also, the parachute. If we needed the parachute, I could repack that as well. So. Life as an ex-technician was quite good for me on the squadron. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, a bit of handy information <laughs> there. Uh, but actually, like on a side note here, did uh, the Rhodesians like did they upgrade the engines, or was it the standard straight from the F6 uh, up to the F9? Was it, or did you make your did own? You, you know, it was a, it was a 207. We had at one stage, um, we obviously with sanctions and all that stuff, but we couldn't get ma- many spares, mm. and we happened to acquire some from. Um, uh, from Oman, in fact, I think it was at the time, um, somewhere up in the Middle East, anyway. And those were, were slightly modified, the 206s, which meant, um, for example, with the 207, it was off the F6, I think, uh, with the 207, we could go up to 8,000 RPM, that was our maximum. Mm. With this engine, it was up to 7,800. Didn't make a lot of difference, I must admit. But that's we had that towards, while I was still on the squadron, we had them. Yeah, that was the only difference. But we never modified them. So what was interesting, though, is that because we couldn't get spares from, or anyone from Rolls-Royce to help us, we used to send them back to Rolls-Royce before the, the before we declared independence. And after that, of course, they shut everything down. So they built an engine shop, and, 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 and the whole engine shop. And I've got one of my friends here in Perth used to work in them. They split the whole thing down. Oh, wow. Only thing that, yeah, the only problem is that I think they also worked on the FCU, but that was a sort of sealed unit. And I think as long as it was still working, they didn't play with it too much. But the engines themselves, um, they, they split the whole thing. And the Royal Royce came out after Indep- Zimbabwe independence and said, are oh, you guys doing fine? Keep on going, sort of thing. You know? the, the guys did a really good job. <clears throat> and and um, the engine was an amazing engine. I've got to mention this as well, because it happened uh, it occurred twice. 
The first time was a technician, and the chap four aircraft came back into formation, back for the airfield. They did a big break in landing, you know, and we always come from the north low. It was in the, out in the bush, so we lots of noise and everything. Nice. And they landed, and the guys walked away, the four pilots walked away, and they'd been on the range, and obviously done well. They were all talking about it. The one guy came back and said, um, there's something wrong with this aircraft. I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> all I didn't, I didn't just, just felt that when I went up, uh, there was something wrong. And anyway... The engine, the, the engine guy came and said, Can I have a look at this? And the back engine was just white. He'd actually picked up shrapnel. We couldn't buy ball ammunition. So all we used was always high velocity um, and uh, high explosive stuff, HE stuff. And we used to have a, a, a minimum height of 500 feet, but obviously someone got through. And that engine was basically had to be re completely reconstructed. Okay. Uh, many years later, I was doing a strike um, in practice on the range, and we hit a car. And as I went up and turned, I was number two. I didn't, I just felt it wasn't quite right. Nothing inside the cockpit showed anything was wrong. And we, and, and I said to my the black guys in formation, can I just come and sit next to you for a while? And I had 200 RPM more than he did. And I, and I said, I don't know what the problem is. He said, what's the problem? I said, it's okay, we'll be okay. We went back, landed, and we got to the cockpit. And I said to the chap, I said, this airplane engine, you probably have to throw it away. What do you mean? What? I said, I can't show you anything here. Go and have a look. And sure enough, the blood taking us half the car through the engine, and it just kept on going. It was probably virtually a ramjet by that stage because it yeah. was just blades in the, in the thing. Amazing engine, absolutely amazing. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, absolutely impressive engineering that, isn't it? Wow. Oh my word! Yeah, <laughs> a big jet, a big jet, turbo jet, a wonderful engine. Yeah, won't stop <laughs> any. Yeah. So, Steve, have you have ever uh, flown in live combat or live theatre? Yes, just shortly, not, about a year after I went onto the squadron, um, we had a target, um, a large target, uh, um, that the SAS had found, and it required um, all of the aircraft available, well, all the pilots are basically available, to neutralize it. And the SAS um, dropped in the middle of the night, and um, they approached the target, and um, in the early morning, um, when they were ready, the, the, we had a promise at that stage. They were our, our close support aircraft who would then mark for us. He came in and we took off at dawn and flew up five of us. And the whole object was to take us out in two strikes. It was a large area, a big bend in the river. And um, it worked very well. As soon as the, 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 as the, um, the promise came into the target, the close support, the SAS mortared into the mm -hmm. area. And as it, the mortar he found the target, the provost turned in with a um, map on and dropped the map on. And as the map on dropped, we were we were descending onto the target. The boss picked it up, and the five of us then went one up the other. Rockets first. We had all the whole rocket, the, uh, the, all the the and that was the thirty eight millimeter rockets, and snap took them. And then the second time around was with front gun, and we started it was a nine second burst. We started way out, one after the other. And after that, we had uh, we, we've got very very um, a, a good camera, an F ninety five camera, which was on the output pod. Number five went around again and took low level shots of it, and basically there was nothing left. We we didn't get any um, a recce, uh, on the ground recce about it, but uh, from our point of view, it was our first big strike and it was very successful as far as we were concerned. Yeah, but the guys did a lot more. I, I then moved on to mirages, but the guys did a lot more after that. Yes, similar sort of similar sort of tasks. Yeah, and did you find that scary as a pilot, or was it just like I'm focused on the job? You know, Mike, I, mean, I do quite a few talks around the place, and it, it comes up often. You know, I think, and it's something I've heard about a lot of guys talk about. You just don't want to stuff up. Mm. You know, uh, I, I just don't. You know, you, you, you've got a task to do, and you've got all you've got. To, your switching's got to be right. And everything's got to be in the right. You don't want to, and it's what I want to remember. Is, and I think it's a fighter pilot's lament. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to stuff this up, you know. And and I think that at the end of the day is what it's all about. And we fig we figured we had a a real enemy, and so and it was in our in our own um, er area. So that's all I can say about it. even in the helicopters and everything I flew. You go into combat. I just think to myself, I just don't want to stuff this up, you know. <laughs> Even if you, especially if you're leading it, you know. You know? Yes, I think of course. It's, it's back in my, I'm just saying that there wasn't there wasn't my my whole emphasis. 
But I didn't think about outside of that, the, the fear or anything like that. It was just want to do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, you kind of shared a, a story there. But have you got another, maybe a memorable story from flying the hunter you can share with our viewers? I'm sure you got plenty. I've got this, <laughs> yeah. I've got this many. <laughs> maybe one or two. The one, uh, the one I actually want to mention is the one that um, is that I sent you something. Um, the, obviously, the overnights were amazing. Uh, the one particularly where we went down, they had a, we had a strategic exercise in the city next door. And we went down to, to a place uh, now called Maputo, picked up prawns and wine, came back. And as we yeah. landed, taxi right up to the, the base, and there were 44 gallon drums. A whole a lot of people we invited. I stepped out of the cockpit, I was given a glass of wine. They got the prawns out of those tanks, poured them into, and we had prawns and wine. But, but <laughs> <laughs> tough life. But the one I, 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 I really enjoyed, and it, it started my book for me because uh, it was June COVID. And my, it was my father's birthday. He died 40, 30 years ago, but he loved the idea that I'd become a pilot. He wanted to, and he couldn't. And he was used to travel the country. And he said, um, couldn't you come to visit me in your hunter one day? You know what, I'm in the, I'm in, in, in the country somewhere. And I said, How'd you do? Sure, I'm sure we could probably arrange it. Anyway, <laughs> I had a photo task in his area. So right. I did my photo task, and then I came around. And they could hear me coming. There, there was this... Ooh. Anyway... This thing could take photographs at 500 knots at 100 feet, and it would look like that. And they were beautiful. Anyway, I came around, put the power up, and whoa, went over the head. You can imagine the sound. Anyway, I got back, had the photograph developed, big photograph, and I said to my dad, I phoned him that, and I said, listen, I've got this photograph here. How did it go? And there was silence. And he said, <laughs> please don't do that again. Because you've got this lovely photograph. You can see my dad waving there. You can actually always recognize the guy. You know? He's got all his cattle around him. And the, the, all their heads are down. They're bunk and whatever they're doing. And they had the farm, a couple of farmers there and a couple of African workers and all standing around watching me. Because I knew I was coming. And they, they could see me. But the next minute, it's, wow! They spent the rest of the day picking up fences, rebuilding fences. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so you caused chaos. <laughs> Absolute chaos. Yeah. But I got a lovely photograph out of it. As long as you got a photo. <laughs> there, was, there was one more, a quick one, because I read, read uh, Richard Bach's book, A Gift of Wings, and he, he did the Blue Max flight. And he said every time he came into tech and aircraft, the director would say, no, it's not close enough. And he said he thought he was going to hit one. Well, we made a movie, and I was always the junior part of the squad. I was always the guy who, was the, the, who had to go and do it. And we had to attack this supposed uh, Red Baron. He was a farmer coming from the country, and um, two of us had to attack him. And I came and at him, and I thought, well, this should be good enough. And I went underneath him, and the bloke in the helicopter behind said, no, not close enough. <laughs> but the next time I went in, <laughs> I thought, I'm really going to hit him. And when it comes out, it still doesn't look close enough. But the, the chap in the, in the dug was, oh, he laid him to me on the ground. He said, wow, I thought you were going to the, the jet wash and everything. Wow. So that... <laughs> Yeah, he thought it was really close. Anyway, they were, but when you see the photograph, it's not, so, you know, not as close as you would imagine. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's some great stories. I love the prawn and the wine one. That's great. <laughs> 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 what a story. It's, so, it's, a, it's such a fighter pilot thing to do, which is great. But, uh, yeah, Steve, how many hours did you actually get uh, flying the Hunter? Not all that many, actually. I've, uh, I've flown it in various times from that, from then until now, but probably only about 350, 350 hours. Is that all? But, uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, yeah, but I mean, I hear guys talking about 7,000 hours and 6,000 hours. Oh, uh, yeah. It was amazing. Well, I'm happy I'm I've got uh, I've got 45 minutes on a chipmunk, uh, so I, I feel like <laughs> I, I want to patch and everything, but, uh, <laughs> but I can't no, get but one. But I was fortunate, still, still be speaking to Hunter, having fl flew, it, flew it then. I came back and flew it I left, before I left the Air Force. I flew it in Somalia on a, another story. And then I got to fly it here in, in Australia. You know? And um, technically, there's still wait, one waiting for me to fly. The same one again, that was started again in Australia. And I've either got to fly it or I've got to ride in it anyway, because I gave him my electric starter mode for my Hunter. So it's been yes. with me all my time. 